Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to start off with a, with a kind of a, an echo of Tom and confess that when, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming up on 50 now, and I'm getting to that age where friends are writing books. And uh, they're very often, uh, you know, painful to read. And you have to sort of like express, you know, your enthusiasm in, 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 a, in, a, in a kind of a manufactured way. But I had the same reaction as Tom. I loved this book. I thought it was great. It was a lot of um, distilled wisdom. And um, in some ways, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of like your target demographic. Mm -hmm. We should just say, as a matter of personal history, yes. I feel like this is, this is a, a, a kind of like a, a military unit buddy that I'm getting back together with. Because the process of we both worked together on getting Google into China, uh, that was, I have to say, one of the most, I think one of the most difficult business problems mm -hmm. that I've ever seen teams tackle. Um, it was incredibly stressful and difficult. For... And then you just left me there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's true. Uh, that's true. I mean, I don't know. You get the, you get the home leave. Uh, you take the home leave. Um, but so, so I'm going to take this uh, conversation a little bit out of the order of the book. And what I want to do for the, for the benefit of the audience in particular is to start off with uh, a basic understanding of what we mean by AI. Okay. Like, let's talk about the technology and in particular, um, can you help us understand what it was about 2006, 2007, 2008? What is the big thing that changed sure. that has made this technology that you've been working on basically your entire adult life now a, a significant force in the world? Sure. Uh, well, it's a really, real pleasure to be here. Um, I've been working on AI for 38 years, since my sophomore year. Um, the first uh, 33 of which uh, ended up with absolutely, basically, um, no output because, because AI was premature. And, and two things happened in the last five to 10 years. Uh, one was the invention of a technology called deep learning. And what deep learning is, is a, uh, a way for a electronic brain uh, can take huge amounts of data and given objective functions. That is, you tell it to do something. It's humanly created objective functions. Uh, it can train itself on massive amounts of data and reach superhuman performance. But with a couple of caveats, one, you have to have huge amounts of data. And two, um, it works only in a single domain and cannot cross domains. And three, you have to tell it what the right answer is so that it can learn. So feed it a billion faces and tell, tell the system, each one, who is Andrew, John, and so on, or feed it a lot of speech, or feed it a lot of Amazon clicks, and which ones led to buying, which ones didn't, uh, or feed it a lot of um, a video taken from a car, and have it learn when you should turn left or right. Uh, so it's outcome-based tagging that gives deep learning huge amount of feedback for it to learn to do uh, something for for an environment, for a situation that it hasn't seen before. So unlike uh, what you would intuit, uh, the human does not go in and say, OK, you're recognizing um, Andrews. He's got these glasses. They're black, and they're round shape like this. You don't do that at all. You just show enough pictures of Andrew and let the system figure it out. So the magical thing is uh, the thing kind of programs itself. Um, of course, you need some AI scientists to tweak things and that it achieves superhuman accuracy. So we, we've seen this applied to AlphaGo, beating the human world champion. Uh, it's, we've seen it applied to face recognition. Um, face recognition systems can recognize 3 million people. None of us can probably do 3,000. Uh, speech recognition is now exceeding human uh, recognition accuracy. Um, and then recogni rec recognizing uh, a cancer certain types of cancer MRIs better than uh, radiologists. So this will continue. Uh, but keep in mind, it only works in a single domain. Um, cannot cross domains. So, um, so one big thing that changed uh, that enabled what we now uh, understand deep learning to be able to do is there's a lot of computer power, yeah. uh, computing power in the world that is networked and very right. cheap. <clears throat> right. The second thing is, that computing power and the proliferation of sensors mm -hmm. in our phones, mm -hmm. in our lives, in many different ways, produced oceans of data. Yep. A third ingredient, though, is a technique uh, known as a neural net. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Can you tell, help us understand how a neural net works and what it is that was new and innovative about it? Yeah, so neural nets are at the center of deep learning. Deep learning is basically a, a way to train neural nets. So think of neural nets as having, as a gigantic, think of it as a gigantic spreadsheet-like thing. And you feed it tons of data, and then you click a button, and answer comes out. Okay, so just like you do your you know, quarterly uh, reports, you feed it all the salaries and income and profit and all that, click, your EPS comes out. The difference is uh, you actually have to program your Excel spreadsheet. This deep learning says this is an Excel spreadsheet that requires no programming. Uh, just feed it enough data and tell us each case what the answer should be, and it figures out all the middle magic. And deep learning is deep in the sense that it has thousands of layers, and there's a mathematical algorithm that will teach the system to train itself and optimize the outcome. So if we want to do a face recognition system, we would feed it a lot of faces with tags. Uh, this is Andrew, this is John. And then the system will continue to iterate until it feels like it can do no better. And when it's done, it, it's op basically it's, it's optimizing on the objective function, maximize human face recognition rate. So it's directly maximizing something that a human can tell it to do, given the tagging. Also, I want to comment on the data and the computation. Uh, I want to give an excuse why my PhD thesis didn't change the world. Uh, uh, I did my PhD thesis in 1988. It was uh, by far, the, at the time, the best speech recognition system that existed. It was so good that people didn't believe me. I had to publish the open source code and all the data. Uh, to prove that it was actually real. Uh, however, uh, and also, I had a huge amount of data. I had the world's largest database in 1986, and it was 100 megabytes. <laughs> <laughs> Your five songs, right? <laughs> <laughs> but back then, that cost $100,000 for my advisor. I mean, that was uh, worth two houses in Pittsburgh, where I did my <laughs> thesis. <laughs> so now you can imagine how much more data we have. I mean, speech recognition companies probably use 100T. So now that's a, a million times more computation. Similarly, uh, sorry, a million times more storage. Similarly, computation probably went up uh, just as much. And, and it was really the combination of uh, a lot of compute, a lot of data, and this deep learning algorithm that made this breakthrough possible invented about 10 years ago, starting to see traction about five years ago, and now it is the hottest thing uh, everywhere. So let's take the example of a bank loan officer. And let's talk yeah. about how AI might mm. replicate or, or supplant that function. So okay. a bank loan officer gets a loan application, uh, and then using human judgment with probably a rule book, tries to make a decision about whether this is a good candidate for a loan, bad candidate for a loan. How would yeah. AI tackle that situation? Uh, actually, we invested in such a company, so I'll describe the company. Um, the company also takes a lot of input, but the input is a lot more than what's filled on the forms. It requires a form, your address, name, uh, uh, social security number, but, it, but in the case of the company we funded, it's an app for a loan. And you download the app, you fill out the things that you would have filled out for the loan app, and it also asks for your permission to transmit up information from your phone. But, but not to worry too much, it's at the same level that Android allows Facebook, Snapchat, Google, YouTube to take. Nothing more, nothing more than that. So it takes all that information and, and is fed into a network that was trained on basically um, millions of people who have previously used the app and borrowed the money and there was an app, rather than teaching abstract concepts on this is trustworthy or not, it is trained on the very fact whether you return the money or not. So millions of people, um, let's say a million people borrowed money, um, let's say 900,000 returned the money, then um, the system learns we want to lend money to more like people like those 900,000. The 100,000 who didn't return the money defaulted, ran away, because it's just an app. Uh, it trained, don't lend more money to people like that. And then the system basically determines, uh, trains itself to uh, minimize default rates. So one of the interesting things about the way AI works in that context is that uh, 
factors which to a human would be ludicrous to take mm -hmm. into consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, how much battery life is left on your phone, let's yep. say. How, yep. uh, what day of the week it is, what yep. time of day you applied, um, what altitude you're at, who knows. Things which are absolutely not co ca uh, causally related to the outcome that we want might actually prove to have what you refer to as mm -hmm. weak features. In yep. other words, there are strong indicators, weak indicators, yeah. and th what the AI can do that no human can could do is make effective use of those weak indicators. Exactly. I mean, we think they're not causally related, but actually they are. Otherwise, AI would have ignored them. So all the things you transmit up the phone are fed to the deep learning. And when you have a million pieces of data, uh, the system will learn what's causally related and what's not, what we think is irrelevant. Uh, so as an example, the day of the month is quite important. And we, I can explain to you why. Uh, the reason is, if it's close to a payday, um, then, then um, it is likely to be okay because you're getting paid soon to pay back. If it is just after a payday, it's likely to, pre to be problematic because uh, you just got paid, why do you need a loan? So when is your payday? Well, it can infer your payday based on all kinds of things, the type of job you have, uh, where you live, and things like that. So it's all magically in the, in the network. It's not absolutely right. It's wrong some of the time. But these weak features, and, and then the, my favorite one is the battery life. <laughs> you would think it has absolutely no bearing on the person's trustworthiness. But apparently it does. Uh, if you think about it, it, conceivably, I don't know if this is why, conceivably people who keep running out of batteries are not as conscientious <laughs> and trustworthy. Right? <laughs> uh, but also keep in mind, there are 3,000 features. Battery life is probably one of the least important ones. But nevertheless, the system takes into account 3,000 things and how they correlate with each other to come up with the, the maximum result. So it has strong things like income, uh, rental, um, uh, savings, um, whether you own properties, and so on. And then it has all these weak ones. It adds it all together. No human can possibly do that. I'd just like to point out that my battery is at 69%. OK. In case so, you were. So here, here's some, some, some oh, money. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will definitely pay you back tomorrow. Um, so Actually, only in the United States can I do this. In China, we have no cash. Maybe we'll. Yeah, if you just want to. Well, do you want to get. WeChat me. Yeah. Ollie pay me. That's OK, too. We can get to that. Is that coming up, or should I explain that? We're going to get to the China stuff in just a second, actually. Right. I want to do one more we'll thing. So, so, we, so we're sort of setting the table here, like what AI is. But crucially, um, part of your book is about what AI is not. And so one of the you know, fun things about growing up in the 70s and 80s was this um, you know, incredible diet of science fiction that we mm -hmm. got to grow up alongside. And um, obviously, Silicon Valley people are never prone to kind of like fads and groupthink. We're all very individual thinkers with our own ideas. But it does seem to have been the case that lots of people in the Valley in recent years, uh, and I won't name names, but Elon Musk is one of them, um, <laughs> uh, have uh, painted a, a very dire picture mm -hmm. of the implications if we take the kind of AI that you just described, the neural nets that sort of like bind together massive data sets to mm -hmm. derive correlations and be able to answer questions. If we project that forward a couple more technical generations of exponential investment, growth, and advancement, um, they talk about either an event horizon where artificial intelligence will overwhelm human intelligence, a singularity where mm -hmm. uh, computers will become smarter than uh, uh, people. Um, your book argues that that is a, a flawed conception. Why? Why is that not likely to happen? Right. Um, the idea of singularity is basically based on when you read newspapers, are we not seeing rapidly more and more news about AI doing Go, doing solving cancer, beating humans at speech recognition? The, you know, the past year has been accelerating news. And if, if you believe that accelerating news are correlated to accelerating technology breakthroughs, then singularity means exponentially one day you'll suddenly wake up and realize you know, uh, a year ago there was one breakthrough. Um, half a year ago there were 10 breakthroughs. Last month there were 100 breakthroughs. Today I wake up and I'm controlled by, um, by, by machines. But that idea, is, well, I think you know, exp that's the nature of exponentials. But the, the, the flaw in that argument is that 
there's fundamental technology as well as applications exponentially growing. But actually, the underlying technology is just deep learning. And they're being exponentially or rapidly, increasingly adapted for different domains. So we're seeing news like that, but the underlying is just one technology. It's like if I were to invent, uh, let's say we didn't have electricity, and suddenly magic happened, we had an electrical grid. And you're going to see, you know, electrical iron, electrical computer, electrical cars go up like that. But it doesn't mean electricity is going to take over the world. So technology-wise, deep learning is the single huge breakthrough in the 50, 62 years of AI history. And it was invented 10 years ago. And there hasn't been another invention of equivalent impact. So I think to project uh, such uh, exponential increase is not consistent with the data that, that we've seen. Um, and also, just if, I, if you go and read all the papers now, uh, no engineer would have any idea how to build, solve any of the problems that the systems have today. I mentioned it's limited in that it's only a single domain and it has to be objective answer. So things like common sense, uh, cross-domain thinking, strategic thinking, uh, creativity are definitely absent. Uh, the ability to do complex planning uh, is absent. And certainly self-awareness and emotion were nowhere to how to program that. And each of these will require one or two or three breakthroughs. So we're many breakthroughs away. Uh, I, I, don't, um, I don't exclude the future possibility. There might be a day when machines exceed us, but we need to see a lot more progress, and we're nowhere near. Um, I, think we're at, I think I'm pretty confident in saying in 20 years, 30 years, there would not be singularity. Phew. Uh, on behalf of the audience. Um, so uh, let's turn then to the China part of the story. So your, your book makes one factual observation that I think is very important for Americans to get. It will not be news to many of the people in this room, but let's we'll talk about it. And then it also makes a claim. Uh, so the factual observation is that China is no longer a copycat uh, mm -hmm. economy. Right. It is no longer um, a country that uh, 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 grows its technology sector by looking at the rest of the world and then doing kind of pale knockoff versions for China. The claim is that uh, what China has become is a place uniquely well positioned to be able to uh, lead in at least three of the four areas of AI, yeah. uh, and generally to drive the world forward from mm -hmm. uh, the perspective of AI. And so let's talk about those two things in, in sequence. So first of all, um, uh, China's internet sector is, mu uh, it, you, you refer to it as kind of like a unique ecosystem, a distinct ecosystem, uh, different from the United States, and no longer driven by copycat innovation. Can you tell us a little bit more about what uh, it's like there? Yeah, sure. I, I think the stigmatism about copycatting um, is causing Americans to not see that you can begin a copycat and become an innovator. Just because in the US that never happens, it doesn't mean it can't happen. Uh, after all, when we learn uh, music and art, don't we start by copycatting? And then with more practice, we come up with our own ideas. That's what happened in China. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, it, there were absolute copycats. There was the you know, Google of China, Amazon of China, and so on. Um, but as the market rapidly expanded, uh, and then massive capital flowed into China because everyone saw in this very fast market where mobile usage was increasing, it's a great place for investment. And in fact, uh, the VC funds like ours have produced outsized returns. So uh, with massive amount of money feeding into entrepreneurs who used to be copycats, imagine what happens, right? Um, you have maybe, let's say you have another great idea, let's say Groupon. This happened about eight years ago. Uh, and a bunch of Chinese entrepreneurs said, well, let's do a Chinese Groupon. And then, but, but we've learned a lot. We can innovate new ideas and make it better on top of Groupon. Uh, so in order for you to succeed, there are, there, you are in a class of 5,000 Groupon copycats. So that's what happened eight years ago. And there's really only one way to win, and that is to make your version of Groupon um, uncopyable. Mm. And that, from that evolved China's formula for um, innovation, 
entrepreneurship and value creation. So how does that work? I'll give you an example. Uh, the American Groupon, now worth a couple of billion dollars um, in market cap, maybe a lot less in enterprise value, mm -hmm. but, the, but the Chinese version of Groupon is now $55 billion IPO. And what happened? It's not just the, how large the market is. It's what the entrepreneur has chosen to do. When you're surrounded in an environment of tenacious entrepreneurs who are not afraid to copy, you must build a very high wall that no one can climb over. So Meituan CEO Wang Xing managed to, to basically change the way Chinese people eat. So it's a lot more daring than a Yelp or a Groupon. Um, those nicely added to the way we eat. But Wang Xing, the Meituan CEO, decided he would change the way Chinese people eat. He wants to, people to do food delivery, food ordering from home, um, and instead of cooking or going out. So he found out what it would take to do that. If, if you could deliver to, let's say, um, 500 million of the 800 million Chinese internet users within 30 minutes from the time of order, including cooking, the hot food to the home, and that delivery cost no more than 70 cents, then he could break even. So that's what he was faced up against. Most entrepreneurs say, that's crazy. In the 70 cents, how, even with Chinese salaries and urban density, how do you do it? <laughs> well, how did he do it? He just chipped away at it over five years. Every month chipped away one or two cents, three or five cents, eventually got to the 70 cents. And the way he ended up was he had to manage a, an army of 600,000 electrical moped riders. Um, and he had to, because they're cheap, well, 70 cents per delivery. So the salaries have to be low. Yet, the service has to be good. So how do you train these, these people? Um, and then also, the mopeds run out of battery. How do you replace the battery? Um, and then there's a routing algorithm and AI, of course. So building this kind, and also you're burning VC money, right? All of this stuff is burning VC money. <laughs> when I told you earlier about the loan app of the million uh, applicants and the 100,000 defaulted on the loan, so how do you get that data? VC giving them the money, and then it gets lost. <laughs> and then you get trading data. Then for the next million, you don't lose so much. So that's what uh, Wang Xing did. He raised several billion dollars to perfect this system. And eventually, he built the best, amazing, Uber-like delivery network for food to the home. And he shaved it down to 70 cents after years and years of trying. What was the downside and risk if he hadn't succeeded? Suppose he could only get down to $1.70, $1.70 per order. Well, he has 25 million orders a day, so he'd be losing $25 million a day had he not done that. So, so this is the Chinese entrepreneurism. It is um, the tenacity, the work ethic, um, the competitiveness, the winner take all, and do whatever it takes to erect such a high wall that your product becomes uncopyable. Now, you could say that's not innovative, but actually, if I offer the service to you, you take it, right? You say, wow, that's amazing. I didn't, never realized I could get the service. So it is an innovative product at the end, but it wasn't derived by a light bulb going off. It was derived by incredible hard work, risk taking, tenacity. Uh, as a yeah, leaving, you know, le entirely apart from the AI parts of your book, actually, yeah. the chapters which describe the kind of innovation economy in, right. uh, in China make this book you know, worth reading in and of themselves. I, I love that part of the book. The, um, the contrast that you draw is between Silicon Valley companies that valorize sort of originality of idea, uh, frown upon copying in any way, shape, or form, and where the VCs keep their eyes especially attuned to companies that will have tremendous amounts of leverage. In other words, the thinnest possible company yeah. that will apply <clears throat> technology to solve an information problem and create a ton of value. So Uber, for example, an app with a back end and some customer support and no cars, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. By contrast, you, you show how Didi uh, in uh, China yeah. is buying gas stations yeah. and buying repair facilities yeah. where the company that does short-term apartment listings, um, the name of which I'm forgetting, is uh, uh, providing services like cleaning and restocking. And um, so in China, the hyper-competitive atmosphere means that, uh, and different labor uh, dynamics mean that to build a moat around your business, you do the gritty, grungy, 
uh, brick and mortar business type activities mm -hmm. in order to build a full vertical stack. Right. Silicon Valley companies don't do that. And so very often when they come to China, try to replicate the American model that's worked over here, they get crushed. Mm -hmm. We've seen that with Amazon, with mm -hmm. eBay, with Yahoo, with Google, mm -hmm. to some extent with Microsoft. Um, uh, and so um, one of the things then that I think is interesting is you draw a contrast between market-driven entrepreneurship in China, mission-driven mm -hmm. entrepreneurship in the US. Uh, can you say a little bit about like the roots of that kind of culturally and why it is that Chinese entrepreneurs are so good at that? Yeah, well, um, China is a market where uh, user need becomes, becomes the source of uh, working hard in, in, in innovation, solving the user problem. And, and the Chinese entrepreneurs um, come from a background. Imagine single child, even though that policy has changed, but people in their 30s are likely to be a single child um, who has huge expectations from his or her two parents and four grandparents that he or she will take care of the six of them. And that they tell him, you're the first generation in the last 10 or 20 generations that has a chance because you went to college or you went to US and got a PhD. Now you've got to go do this. You got to be the Jack Ma, you got to, you got to do this. There's a pressure. There's also the um, uh, Deng Xiaoping about 40 years ago uh, basically opened up China for market economy and he said, let some people get rich first, right? That was in sharp contrast with the system before. And now you can imagine 1.3 billion people all want to be that some people <laughs> who get rich first. Fe fearing that if you fell behind, you might not be the, the fortunate. So it's under those conditions that people have the work ethic they have, the tenacity they have, um, and also the Chinese education is more about rote learning. So um, a Steve Jobs, like let's say someone had Steve Jobs DNA, uh, what was born in China, it's likely that they would not be given the freedom to think different and drop out of college and start a company. Um, and instead, he might become an outlier. So it is a completely different culture and background that led to this, um, this uh, type of um, entrepreneurism. So in China, then, we've got these, these market-driven entrepreneurs. These are some of the ingredients that you lay out. Another key one is mobile-first users. So basically, the country had desktops and laptops, but in very small numbers <clears throat> relative to the population. The yeah. smartphone, and especially the cheap Android smartphone, mm -hmm. really becomes the default computing device. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a single super app WeChat that pulls together many different services, yeah. provides an, an ecosystem, dense cities, cheap labor, a mobile payment system, mm -hmm. a government-backed culture shift that you just described. Yeah. So all of these ingredients put together then make China a place that has entrepreneurs and incredible amounts of data. And building on that uh, uh, is a Chinese advantage in artificial intelligence. Exactly. So we talk all about, entre in the book, we talk, I talk about the entrepreneurship and the companies build and the culture because to build a great AI company at this point, think about all the things I told you about AI, what do you need? Well, you need um, a lot of data and China has so much data. So in the age of AI, I often talk about data is the new oil and China is the new Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so China has all the data, not only more people, but more depth because so many services are digitized. Uh, you're riding a shared bicycle, ordering food, and so on and so forth. So a lot of data. China has entrepreneurs, and AI gets better with data. So the entrepreneur process is you start with an idea, you try it out. Uh, if it doesn't work, you pivot. But with AI, you pivot with the data. So if it works, you, got, you get more data. Then it works better, you get even more data. So that's what happened with the long example I gave. Right. First, they have some handwritten rules that had 20% default rate, lost a bunch of money. Then they trained a system that had 15% default rate, lost a bunch more money. Then they trained up another system based on that data, then it has 10% default rate. And now the default rate is 3%. And now it's making massive money. And it comes from iteration of not only the product to be a better um, user fit, um, but also the gathering, iterative gathering of data to make the AI more robust. 
Similarly, if you were to do autonomous vehicles, if you launch faster, you collect more data, that's arguably uh, to your favor. So the Chinese entrepreneurs are tenacious, they they're work very hard, they uh, are very fast, they collect a lot of data, they get going, um, they don't need the final vision, they first get something going and collect more data and let it blossom. So um, uh, a last point I'll make is that uh, because deep learning is the technology, it's been invented for 10 years, people, there are a lot of people who know how to use it. It's no longer in the laboratories, is no longer held in the minds of few, like in the days of Manhattan Project in Enrico Fermi, he had a, only he, only he and a small number of people uh, can do this. AI is known by millions of people throughout the world, and China has so many engineers and students eager to get in. Um, the entry barrier is not as high as you think, especially unless you're doing autonomous vehicle or something really, really fancy. So China, so AI has shifted from the era of discovery and invention to the era of implementation. One of the nice, um, I think, analogies that you, that you use uh, to that shift is, is to electricity. So electricity, mm -hmm. is the, the, the harnessing of electricity is a major discovery. Yeah. And then the economic growth for about 100 years is people finding ways to stick electricity into every single part of human life. Right. And that's not Nobel Prize winning scientists. No. In, in your terms in the book, those are tinkerers. That's right. And AI is faster than electricity because you don't need to build an electrical grid. Uh, there's already cloud, Amazon cloud, Google cloud, Alibaba cloud, that have AI on it. So tinkerers can start to tinker uh, right now, uh, even only after uh, two or three years after the technologies become uh, available on the cloud. So the data is an advantage. The people uh, uh, that China has and their, their sort of work ethic orientation, training, and so forth uh, are an advantage. Um, another th sort of third pillar of advantage that you call out is that for some of the kinds of benefits that we want to be able to derive uh, from AI, a top-down government that is willing to absorb risk with a long-term view mm -hmm. will have an advantage. And mm -hmm. so, for example, in the case of autonomous vehicles, um, in this country, uh, uh, people freak out when there's an accident. Mm -hmm. And you see uh, a lot of reaction. And there's a, both a legal culture and maybe a kind of like a, a risk-averse maturity in our, in our culture that says um, AI, uh, autonomous vehicles are going to have to be like perfect before we're going to let them on our mm -hmm. streets. Whereas in China, the kinds of infrastructure investments that could enable AI can be both dictated by the government and short-term uh, risk can be absorbed in the interest of what is clearly going to be a safer street when mm -hmm. autonomous vehicles predominate. Right, uh, absolutely. I, I think um, if one wants autonomous vehicles to be perfect before they can be launched, then there will never be autonomous vehicles. Because as I described, data is gathered iteratively. So more data improves the algorithms, gives uh, feedback to the scientists who build better products. It's got to be an iter iterative loop. Now, we obviously have some minimal requirement, whether it's in US or China. If the, if the vehicle is drives worse than people, we should not let it out on the streets. <laughs> but if it's better than people, well, I mean, one could debate whether it needs to be 1% better than people or 10%. That's a reasonable discussion. But if you want it to be perfect, then that country that demands perfect autonomous vehicle uh, will lose in the technolog technological race because it's the iterative approach that will work. But there needs to be some degree of minimal responsibility. That's kind of the first point. But the other way is um, I think Chinese government uh, actually lets the private enterprises invest in companies to build the products. Um, but Chinese government will go in to do public infrastructure investments that no private company can do. For example, uh, China is building a, a new city called Xiong'an, which is the size of Chicago, designed for autonomous vehicle. The, cent the downtown of Xiong'an has two layers. Pedestrians, pets, and bicycles are on top, and vehicles on the bottom. So that will eliminate the likelihood of a car hitting pedestrian, the worst kind of um, accidents. Um, and the Zhejiang province is building a highway with sensors designed to uh, hint to autonomous vehicles to avoid accidents. The city of Suzhou 
um, uh, this is, came out after my book, uh, came out with a two layer, 10 square kilometer space where on top is, are, the auto uh, are the human drivers, bottom is the autonomous driver. It's kind of cleverly designed because you know, one of the issues, including the Tesla accident, was a result of lighting. You know, AI with this camera may not see things in the right color because of lighting. So if you put the, the, essentially put the autonomous driver in a basement that's consistently lit, then there's less variation, can, can get it going. So almost, you're almost seeing, well first we're seeing Chinese government putting huge amount of dollars into this infrastructure building. And secondly, we're sort of seeing local governments are sort of like entrepreneurs trying new ideas. Uh, Well-informed entrepreneurs. We don't know which one will be the best, but I think that's uh, the kind of spirit we'll see moving this forward. Uh, there are some people who would still say, is this uh, government giving help to, disadvan to advantage China against other countries? Uh, I would argue it's not dissimilar from President Eisenhower, who put in the interstate highway, which is the public infrastructure that um, pushed America forward. You know, as I feel compelled as an American to at least point out that there is, like, to take the Zhejiang example, uh -huh. um, you know, there is some risk, which your book acknowledges, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, that, um, you know, for example, if Zhejiang builds a sensor laden, radio frequency enabled highway, will it be the right standards? Will the sensors be out of date in two years? Mm -hmm. You know, who knows? Maybe <clears throat> the companies absorb sure. it and adopt it or not. Um, there are some risks to top down. Yes. Let me just challenge you on, on sort of one thing, and then I, I want to reserve a couple of minutes to talk about the jobs threat okay. that, you, that you identify. But let me, let me press you on one point. Chinese companies have been notoriously bad at succeeding outside China. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and one of the things that your book points out is that, that the, the core advantages that it has to produce better AI produce better products, produce better uh, and faster, more efficient uses of AI to um, uh, 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 serve people. Um, isn't it possible that, that the advantages that uh, uh, China has over American companies operating in China will be handicaps when those Chinese companies try to, for example, understand a Belgian loan market? Mm -hmm. uh, is there something about AI that makes it so synthetic and abstract that it's easily exportable, or do you think Chinese companies will have to really up their game, struggle, learn how to succeed in Brazil or China, yeah. because the things that they've learned how to do in China are just as inapplicable as Brazil as yeah. you know eBay was in China uh, ten years ago? Right. Um, so first, China is such a large market. Most Chinese companies just focus on the Chinese market. It's too much extra work and opportunity cost to go to ex external markets. So, so far, we largely see China just in China, and the US companies go elsewhere, and some markets accept US technology, some develop their own. But I will also say this is changing, um, because after all, the China, China market saturation is close. So top Chinese companies are looking at how to expand. But they've, looked, they've, been, but, but they've studied the American cases, where the American single platform approach didn't quite provide the right perfect answer for all the markets. And, and China experienced it itself. And it also tried to take um, you know, WeChat abroad, Baidu search abroad, not with a lot of success. So I think the collective recognition in China is that um, the large giants, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, Didi, Total, they would not necessarily expand themselves overseas, but partner overseas. So Alibaba is investing externally, Southeast Asia, uh, India, and uh, Didi is actually investing. And when they invest, they also inject technology. Uh, for example, there are some countries which have local, um, local share writing apps that are losing to Uber. But when Didi invested in them, Didi also gave them the app technology, the look and feel, the route finding, and the AI behind it to help the so-called local insurgents have a chance against the American leaders. So I think that's going to be one approach. Another approach is there are still some purely digital services that don't require local partnership, and companies like ByteDance or Total are expanding to other markets. Um, so I'm seeing an increasing number of Chinese companies, whether through investing and injecting technology or going directly, or actually copy from China. 
That is, Chinese companies are awkward when they try to copy an American technology to Brazil. But copying a Chinese technology by another company to Brazil is a lot easier. <laughs> so, because it's well known, it's inherent, you use it every day. So generally speaking, I think going five years in the future, I think America will continue to dominate. You gave Belgium as an example. I think US will continue to dominate Europe, basically developed countries. US, Europe, English speaking countries, Japan. I think China's going to have a really good shot at um, um, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, possibly India, uh, probably uh, Islamic countries, especially Middle East, and definitely Africa. Mm -hmm. So we're going to sort of see the world um, in two parallel universes with Chinese expanding beyond mainland China. But China's expansion to other countries will not be as strong an ownership as Google or Facebook has in, in Europe. It would be through some investments, partnerships, technology injections. So um, your book ends on a, uh, on a fairly <clears throat> like dire note, I mean a hopeful note, but a, but a fairly dire note about the challenge that is about to hit. Yeah. And that challenge is that um, AI products are going to be able to do lots and lots of things that humans have been doing right. better than those humans, cheaper, more reliably, more accurately. And uh, uh, you cite a range of estimates for how many decades we've got before the big disruptions hit and how many uh, people's job categories will be replaceable. You're on the more uh, uh, pessimistic or, or, or optimistic, I'm not even sure which way to say it, um, depending on whether I'm speaking for the Star Trek uh, computer uh, or myself. Um, but uh, you believe that, that uh, that much of the analysis is focused on task-specific jobs and figuring out what AI will be able to do better, you believe that we are underestimating the industry-wide disruptions that can happen where a new technique like the loan uh, uh, company um, can kind of completely replace the way that an industry has been doing business by applying uh, AI. Um, and so uh, there's probably a lot to say about that. I want to save some time for questions, but part of the way that you analyze that problem is different because of your personal experience with uh, lymphoma. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit of the story of like sure. how that hit you and what that taught you about how we can deal sure. with AI. Sure. So first let, let me talk about the why I think there is an issue and then how we might solve it uh, with the, my uh, lymphoma story in the middle. Um, so why, why, do I, why am I more pessimistic that more jobs will get displaced? Because as we discussed, AI is about a single task um, intelligence system that can take care of one task, a repetitive routine task. But if we think about, not people in this room, but on the whole earth, what percentage of people do single repetitive tasks? Or scripts of multiple tasks, each of which is repetitive and routine? We'll probably come to the conclusion that's a fairly large number. And I'm not a disbeliever in human uh, AI symbiosis. I think there are creative jobs, professional jobs, uh, jobs such as um, uh, scientists, columnists, uh, writers, uh, lawyers, uh, that will become better because of AI. Uh, the AI plus the creative or the professional will make do things better than either can do. I'm a huge believer in that, but after all, uh, that is definitely not most of the world's population. Um, so uh, the number of jobs that are non-creative, non-strategic, and repetitive routine is significant. And as AI gets to do them, business people will be forced to make the trade-off. Do I retain my employees uh, and risk getting killed by my competitor, or do I um, automate and then um, deal with the workforce reduction? So that is the, 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 the premise. And then um, where would this 50% or 40% of the people uh, go? What jobs will they take on is the question. That's the first part. Then the lymphoma story was uh, five years ago. Um, I have been sort of a machine, a uh, workaholic, working extremely hard. Uh, maybe my job is not so routine, but it's kind of machine-like and repetitive because I uh, wanted to make a big difference to the world, and I became a workaholic. Um, and um, 
I would wake up uh, twice a night to answer email. When you were emailing me from Mountain View. Don't think I didn't notice. <laughs> I would wake up automatically at 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. almost every night and answer all my email so that my American colleagues were feeling I was responsive and then my Chinese employees would feel that they have to work hard too. <laughs> that, that is the Chinese work ethic we talked about uh, that's leading to China's rise in technology and AI. That's, I think, what a lot of us in the room, as well as a lot of uh, routine job workers, feel about workaholism, that the meaning of our lives is equated with our job. And it was after, the, basically, the week after I found I had lymphoma, after I've had my um, going through the phase of uh, denial, um, why me, uh, <laughs> making my deal with God, uh, writing my will, uh, then I came to realize that my life was, uh, had my priorities all upside down. That in the whatever remaining days that I had, uh, continuing to work was no longer something I wanted to do. Um, that much more important was loving the people I love, giving back love to the people who loved me, and uh, pursuing things that I'm passionate about. It's not about working harder, making more money, becoming more famous. And, and it was that realization and that process that got me to think, so when all the, aren't these routine job workers in the same state that I am in, that we were all brainwashed by the industrial revolution um, value that our work equals the meaning of our life. And perhaps AI is a wake up call for us to realize that there is something else. Maybe it's about love, compassion, empathy, human-to-human -human relations. And that if I could imagine our maker could be very frustrated with us, that after thousands of years of evolution, uh, we're still stuck here like rats running on a wheel, uh, doing the routine, same jobs every day, and not spending time on what we're passionate about, spending more time with the people we love, thinking about the meaning of life, but just thinking it's all work, work, work. So maybe our maker is so frustrated that he threw AI at us <laughs> that to take away all the routine jobs so we have time to think and to love. And that also gave me a possible resolution to the job losses. That is, are there possibly enough jobs uh, that are compassionate or empathetic or people-to-people -people interaction so as to retrain and absorb the workforce that might be displaced. So if we think about jobs like um, elderly care, nurses, nannies, these are the perfect compassionate jobs, uh, empathetic jobs, and we sure need a lot more of them. Think about elderly care. People over 80 need five times as much, as much care. Uh, a lot of AI scientists are trying to invent robots to take care of older people, but think, think how, how mean that is. Would, would you, when you get older, or your parents, really want that? I had an entrepreneur who built a robot to take care of elderly, and then the only function that was used was customer service. The, the person would click on it and say, how come my kids aren't here? <laughs> you know, or let me tell you about my grandkids. So elderly people don't want a robot. They want people. And then there are a million elderly care jobs not filled in the US for the simple reason that it's not paid well. So if we believe that AI will generate all this wealth, and some Silicon Valley people we think we should give $20,000 to everybody and be done with it, I think it's much too simplistic. I think, why don't we not give it to everybody? Why don't we take that wealth, whether it's taxed or however generated, and subsidize, um, ed, uh, subsidize elderly care, subsidize teachers to be to increase the student-teacher ratio. As AI takes over the routine parts of a teacher's job, as AI starts to diagnose for the doctor, they can be more empathetic, compassionate. Uh, they might um, need a different kind of training. Uh, we can afford to have 10 times more teachers, 10 times more doctors, and there would be a lot of jobs. You might think, well, how could someone doing a routine job be trained to be a doctor? Well, in 20 or 30 years, when the diagnosis is all done by the AI, the doctor is really just the human interface of dealing with the patient, teasing out the issues, family history, making the patient feel better, 
and giving the patient the confidence. And for that, you don't need a 10-year training, maybe more like a nurse practitioner. So if we think that way, um, uh, and also teachers, um, why, why can't uh, we actually are, there will be a 60-minute segment on, on our work with AI and education um, in either next Sunday or the Sunday after that. It's about uh, a lot of the teacher's job is routine grading homework, giving exams, giving the same lecture over and over again. If we take that out and let AI or MOOC take care of that, maybe teachers can become more mentors on one-on-one -on -one and giving help. And if that happens, we can have a lot more teachers. And if that happens, maybe we should pay people, parents, who choose to homeschool their kids. So these are probably a lot more meaningful ways to spend all the wealth that we collectively make in AI to make the empathetic jobs uh, more meaningful, more better paid, and also to help retrain the displaced routine workers who can move on to those. Well. <laughs> Perfect next end. Let's, let's uh, take some questions from the audience. And while we're raising hands and delivering a mic to somebody, I'll just note that the policy wonk in me, you know, my ears perk up when I, I hear you say that because to me what that says is uh, we're, gonna be, we're gonna need to do steeply progressive taxation of people that are accumulating an ever increasing share of wealth in order to subsidize socially good activities for which there is not currently a viable private employer, which is very interesting. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, let's just go with a hand that I see here through the lights. There's a mic coming for you right here. If you will uh, pronounce your question into the mic. Yes, you say that uh, there's nothing to fear about computers taking over because um, you're, there hasn't been a breakthrough. What I say is that we don't need the breakthrough. What will happen is the computers will evolve. We already use genetic algorithms and probably poor, more powerful algorithms. I'm not a computer scientist. But the way life evolved by just simple chemicals developing ways of um, self-reproducing, the computers eventually will be able to do that. It just requires more computer power. And then take advantage of the facts of how addictive humans are. Just look at the street, how people are totally unaware, and the way food companies develop food products to addict people. So I think eventually computers will be able to do that without an additional breakthrough. They will create their own breakthrough by evolution. What do you think? OK, I, I don't agree. Um, I, well, the current computer algorithms are just dumb tools. I mean, they're really smart in that they're better than us in making loans and all that stuff. But we give it the objective function on which they optimize. Um, I think you can be imaginative and say, can there possibly be some day that they can evolve or self-replicate? But that day hasn't come. And it will be a breakthrough when someone can cross the line and say, this program is now reinventing itself and getting smarter and smarter. You know, media isn't helping this at all. Uh, you've you've, some of you probably read, you know, Facebook Labs came up with uh, a new human language because the robots are talking to each other and they're evolving. <laughs> but but uh, that's just a bug. <laughs> so, so a second. I'm sorry, second question right down in the front row. For those of us who remember Star Trek, we used to say that space is the next frontier. But for we Earthlings, the next frontier is mapping the brain. And that's what's going on today. Beyond the, behind the scenes, money is being committed to it on a long-term basis. And the interplay between artificial intelligence and the br mapping the brain and what we will discover is possible, which we know very little about today, presents us with a an ethical challenge, a cultural challenge, an institutional challenge, which will go to supplement a lot of the problems with artificial intelligence, but which will, but will cause more problems because we haven't got the guidelines and we won't do that for a long period of time. But there are people in this country the young, the 20-year-olds, the 30-year-olds, the early 40-year-olds who are working progressively on this issue of mapping the brain. And they're coming up with not very much at this point, as you did 20 years ago or 25 years, but it's there. 
and it's going to be done, and it's going to have the greatest effect on what we did, just as we did with our blood cells and our genomes. Mm -hmm. This is going to be the next frontier, and will challenge the interplay between the human being and the machine, and there's already problems that, are that I could discuss in that basis at this time, but that's your next frontier, and it's dramatic, and it's going to be consequential. Thank you. I, I, I think that is a possible scenario, but as you said, we don't yet know how mapping the brain and AI will or will not lead to the breakthrough. So to the extent it does, there are big issues. Personally, I would say CRISPR is probably a bigger concern. Mm. That's similar. And there are many other areas, I, I understand. Uh, yeah, I think AI plus other things can lead to all kinds of danger. I was uh, talking to Andrew, when I talked to Andrew earlier, I was referring to this super intelligent cyborg e emerging through singularity as an uh, unlikely or impossible event. I do think regulating the combinations of uh, you know, brain breakthroughs, CRISPR breakthroughs, or if someone comes up with uh, what the previous gentleman said, uh, self-writing programs, uh, when those breakthroughs happen, they may raise other uh, threats or challenges. Also think uh, security is a big problem. People could hack into autonomous vehicles and turn them into uh, uh, killer weapons. So I think there are lots of dangers beyond the job one. Um, I think they haven't quite materialized, but I think we should get ahead of the game and start to study them. Okay, so the enterprise computer, uh, not likely to happen. C-3PO and R2-D2, still a long ways off. Is AI gonna help me get my jetpack? Get your... My jetpack. I still don't have the jetpack that I grew up expecting uh, <laughs> by the time I was Oh, I age. see, from the start. Um, let's do a question over here on the left. Uh, but you know there's already holodeck and all that stuff, right? I mean, when I go to work, my face opens the door, right? And then we're talking to Alexa more and more. So a lot of those non-super intelligent AI things in Star Trek are happening. Mm. And autonomous vehicles mm. are happening. So I, I think they will. Um, Dr. Lee, you mentioned the complementary sort of capabilities of the US and China in AI. Discovery is American, the American forte implementation is Chinese. Now the prospects of cooperation in the current environment are sort of, you know, it's unthinkable. But if we set aside the politics, just from the perspective of sort of, you know, the theory of comparative advantage, I mean, is there a, are there some industries and sectors where the two countries can sort of, you know, leverage their complementary skills and cooperate so not military, mm. but say mm. healthcare or some of these mm. other areas. You talked about these qualities of compassion and empathy and understanding. I mean, is there a scenario of the two taking advantage of their complementary strengths and cooperating? Yes, I, I agree. I think at, a, <clears throat> at the um, theoretical level, it's extremely complementary. Um, if we pick some really hard problem, I think the simple problem, honestly, I think for the simple AI problems, the bank loans and the big data, the internet, the Chinese companies can run really fast. They don't need much help. But for the tougher problems, you know, um, cancer, uh, autonomous vehicle, and things like that, if somehow we could construct the best of the American top researcher and the top fastest of the Chinese implementer, we can deliver solutions much faster. But that's theoretical in practice, you know, export control. Uh, CFIUS and so on would probably make that uh, an impossibility. Uh, but I, I, perhaps we can have hope that in healthcare and education, the two countries can look beyond whatever differences there are in the trade dispute and find a way to work together. Um, I think in terms of um, uh, not working together but just watching each other, I think is another way to build complementarity. Uh, part of the reason for writing this book is to show the Americans who want to build a company but aren't Steve Jobs. This is really saying there is another formula, another way to build a company and study it, right? And I think um, in terms of the compassionate jobs, I think all countries can study each other. Uh, you know, Korea in gifted um, education, um, in, um, we can study um, uh, Japan and Switzerland for craftsmen as a profession, uh, Canada and the Netherlands in volunteerism. So I think in terms of how to create the compassionate professions, uh, all countries can, love from, uh, can learn from each other, and it's not necessary to build one entity 
it's probably enough to just kind of watch, watch and learn. Let me, let me just take a moderator's prerogative and impress you on one thing. One of, so that, that optimistic scenario, the one where you know, the um, uh, different approaches of the different nations can, can be brought together, <clears throat> countries can, can work together, mm -hmm. um, much of the, I think, wave of fear that people have about AI has something to do with the sense that people uh, in positions of power around the world really have not proven themselves able to, able to be trusted with the kind of power mm -hmm. uh, that these technologies can bring. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, thuggishness, uh, I see a lot of it in this country, uh, zero-sum game mentality, mm -hmm. uh, xenophobia, mm -hmm. racism, misogyny. Mm -hmm. People with those kinds of values, given the power of, of AI to make decisions about others, uh, leaves you fairly fearful. Mm -hmm. um, I've been reading a lot recently about kind of military uses of AI, and there's the yeah. thousand drone swarm scenario yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, under any radar's ability to detect, can send a force into a country uh, and destroy a base, a missile silo, a plane, uh, assassinate people. Um, do you see some reason for, uh, <laughs> for hope in, in, in AI's, or, or maybe it's say this somewhat differently, people's ability and our ability to educate people in values like love and uh, 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 commonality of purpose and, and loyalty and so forth, can we get the world into a position faster than AI can get into a position, to, to do good uh, with AI faster than AI will get in, into a position to be misused? Uh, I, I think it's the only thing we can do, uh, but I'm not sure it's, um, that's sufficient to, um, to avoid any of the problems that you mentioned. I think doing all those things certainly will help. And I think countries, um, um, I think actually we almost should view this as a crowdsourcing problem because the problems are too many. And it's not just AI, it's AI and CRISPR and cognitive science and all these other things. Uh, the problems are too many. We should almost crowdsource and let all the countries try different things uh, and then learn from each other. Um, I, I think, you know, obviously UN is not powerful enough to regulate the whole world in each country. Um, every country is now somewhat aware of some of these problems. And, um, you know, for example, Europe has come up with GDPR for privacy protection. While I don't think it's a very good uh, solution, it's at least a step forward and we can learn from it. I don't really have any good answer to this one. If I did, I'd put it in the book. Maybe, maybe it's my next book. <laughs> All right, maybe we gonna... write the next one together. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, Kai Fu, as we look at the things that AI cannot do now, as you mentioned earlier, um, cross-domain, complex planning, self-awareness, e emotion. As, as AI begins to approach these capabilities, do you think the US and China will continue to advance in the ways they've in the past? the U.S. taking the discovery route, China taking the implementation route, or do you think the roles might get switched along the way or shared? Okay, uh, so first the premise is that we would make breakthrough on these areas, and I think in some of them I'm somewhat optimistic in cross-domain thinking, strategy, planning, I do think we'll make progress. Um, things like self-awareness and emotion, I think it becomes a philosophical problem. Uh, whether we believe the sanctity of our soul or that the human can be complete, completely replicated. So we're not going to get into that discussion here. Uh, but, but, but anyway, answering your question about the advances, uh, I would fully expect U.S. to stay at the forefront of research um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I think if there were more funding, if there were more um, open immigration for top minds to the U.S., um, that advantage is going to be very hard for any country to surpass because it's a combination of already existing great universities and research systems. Um, it's a country with a culture of free thinking and it's a magnet that attracts a disproportionate uh, number of high IQ people to come to the U.S. and many of whom will stay. So it's a self-sustaining ecosystem. But in order for this to work, the, the pipeline of people coming in can, cannot be cut off. I think that's kind of the long-term danger there might be. 
Um, but, e but even if small mistakes happen, I think U.S. is bound to be ahead in the area of discovery for um, you know, one or two decades to come, if not longer. Does anybody have a question that can be answered in three minutes? <laughs> All right, let's go to the, uh, just because of the way the lighting here is, I'm going to go with the hands I can see. So the woman in the, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Kai-Fu, nice to see you again. Um, I wonder if you could talk briefly about, there's a lot of political noise, obviously, between U.S. and China now with tariffs and other things. And President Trump has said that China 2025 is a threat to America. I think you do a very good job of translating the differences in, uh, between in China and, and the U.S. in business. Could you translate that politically? Because I think last I checked, you actually have more Twitter followers than the President of the United States. No, no. <laughs> Not anymore? No, never, never did. <laughs> <laughs> never, never did. Um, but, uh, yeah, so about the, chi the various China state plans, uh, I think there is a belief that the China state, the China is one, is, the Chinese government is one entity, and it just puts a lot of money in Chinese companies and gives them an unfair advantage against American companies, and on top of there is their IP issues. Uh, but I want to clarify that. I didn't study the 2025 plan in a lot of detail. I studied the AI plan, uh, 2030 plan, uh, in a lot of detail. It's fairly well written. It sets audacious goals, but it in itself didn't give money to any companies. Um, China's AI, I'm, so I can only speak on AI again, uh, China's entire success so far in AI has been privately funded. Uh, we've created uh, five unicorns. None of them have received government funding. Um, I think there may be a new round that some of them may have it, but I think up to now, they've ha their joint total market valuation is uh, $21 billion US dollars. And there's no, it's all privately funded. In fact, it's largely funded by American money. <laughs> you know, our, our LPs are American uh, pension funds, and then we take that money and when you fund them. So we're making lots of money for you guys. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but what is the role of the government? The government plays, I think, three very important roles. The first is that those documents, especially the AI plan, sets a tone. So once the tone is set, a bank is much more likely to acquire to buy AI software and pay for it. A local government is much more likely to build those two-layer roads. So that tone is important, but it's not ordered down. Each city and each bank can make its own decisions. The second thing they do, the Chinese government does very effectively is infrastructure building, which I've covered, like in the smart highways. And the third area, I think, is the general approach to what in the book I call techno-utilitarian policy which means um, a little bit contrary to the gentleman in the front, the Chinese approach is let these new technologies blossom. Uh, we will watch them closely. And when things don't look right, we'll regulate it. If things really don't look right, we'll stop it. And that is something I think a strong government can do. Uh, as an example, uh, I was going to get to why I have no money in China. <laughs> uh, China <laughs> permitted two large companies to basically eradicate cash and credit cards over the last three years. It's phenomenal. In America, there would probably be all kinds of lobbying, disagreeing, concerns about where the software com companies can be trusted with the money or can only banks and credit card companies, all that. So government basically said, hmm, new technology, looks like a good thing. Let's watch it. Six months later, okay, still looks good, keep going. Then it took over and then there's no cash and no credit cards. But it doesn't mean the government doesn't interfere. Uh, in the cryptocurrency, the government sort of watched it for a while and said, whoa, wait a minute, there are these uh, village ladies buying uh, ICOs. <laughs> That's not going to work. So, they, so the government banned uh, crypt, uh, cryptocurrency and ICOs. So that's the techno-utilitarian approach. I'm not arguing it's good or bad, right and wrong. I'm just describing it as an alternate way of policy, and it seems effective on mobile, internet, and uh, AI. Well, it's time for us to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up with just one question for, for you to maybe speculate about. So one of the, uh, I've invested in a couple of companies recently that have, uh, that are trying to use um, AI to try to persuade people to vote for Democrats. And it's, 
you know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I think I need to do, but I'm not thrilled about its implications for democracy broadly. In other words, the science of persuasion is built on a notion that we have kind of open deliberative discourse and that people can go through reasoned arguments. I'm not sure that the kind of technology that uses AI to figure out how to precisely target messages based on non-demographic characteristics like loyalty or a belief in equality or fairness or whatever, I'm not sure that's so great. Could you speculate if a country wanted to foster like kind of a healthy society, a healthy public domain, a healthy public discourse, how would that country be putting AI to work today? Gosh. <laughs> and this I, is, by the way, a uh -huh. two-minute question. OK. <laughs> Um, I, I think I, for a country to think about using AI tools, I think the country better start first with using AI to listen, uh, to gather input, because that seems a lot more innocuous than using AI to um, brainwash, essentially. Do you think the kind of education uses of AI can produce people that can't just get better grades, but also can be like better citizens? Is there some reason to think that those two things could be, could be correlated um, or not? Yeah, so we actually invest in a lot in AI in education, and we haven't gone to the depth of using AI to promote creativity or um, uh, breakthrough thinking. What we have done is use AI to make students learn their normal courseware much faster. So they have, you know, people, students in China are very poor. They spend a lot more time studying. It's the same 996 uh, crazy studying hours to get crammed into the best school. So the AI use has letting, let them get good grades without spending, you know, uh, until midnight every night studying. So that gave them some time back. So I think. It's up to the parents who need to wisely give that few hours given back to the students to guide their um, kids into um, critical thinking. All right. And on that note, uh, let me say uh, thank you to the Asia Society. And thank please you. join me in thanking Kai Fu. Thanks thank for you. a great book. Thanks.